Don't hit the spiritual snooze button. And you know, um, I want to ask you something. I want you to consider in your personal walk. Think about this for just a moment. In your Christian walk, in your, when you said, Jesus, I accept you as my personal Savior. And you started that walk with the Lord. There's things that's going to come against you. There's enemies of your soul. Satan will try to take you out. He'll try to do everything in his power to break the relationship that you have with Jesus. And I want you to consider today the nudges, if you will, the the guidance that men and women in the Bible of old, in the Old Testament, we can see the nature and and the person of God moving in their lives, directing them and guiding them and and giving those little nudges, if you will. Think about the importance of humility, obedience, and actively seeking to grow closer to God. Actively seeking to grow closer to God. It's easy to be a bystander. It's easy to sit on a pew. It's easy to sit in the bleachers and watch the game. It's a whole nother thing to get out of those bleachers and get on the ball field and start playing, is it not? But getting closer to God in your spiritual walk as a believer. And how many of you ask this question today? How do I know, or better yet, how do I discern whether God is speaking to me or not? How do I know? And I'm gonna, I was talking a little bit about this with Donnie on the way to church this morning. There, there's differences in denominational faiths that some people believe that God said it right here and that's it. He doesn't speak to us no more. Well, we believe that God still actively speaks to his church today, to his bride. Come on. The scripture says that the people without a revelation from God will surely perish. One translation says without a vision. But God's revelation is a vision. God speaks to his church through signs, wonders, miracles, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just for the church of the first century at the day of Pentecost. And they said, well, that's it, boys. What happened is those men that went from hiding in in fear and trembling of the Roman Empire faced the Roman Empire with great courage. They went from cowards to courageous warriors for Christ. But yet, through all of that, how do we know that Christ is speaking to his people? I want us to turn to to the Gospel of John, chapter 10 and verse 27. I'm going to give you a minute Maybe not 60 seconds, but figuratively speaking, I'm going to give you a few seconds. Say amen when you get there. And you people on the cell phone Bibles, you know who you are. You can hold up on your amen just for a second. Let the rest of us paper Bible people get there. (laughs) John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 27. Let me get there. Amen. My sheep. Let me stop right there. When I read this, I can't help it. My mind goes back to Megan's daycare days at North Monroe Baptist Church. Her graduation ceremony in pre-K. They sung this little song. I don't know. It's the first time I'd ever heard it. But they sang, I want to be a sheep. Remember that, Megan? I want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 (laughs) ba. I read this, and it comes back to my mind. You you know, parents, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Grandparents, you know too. But the scripture says, my sheep hear my voice. And it's interesting about sheep. Um, Sheep are not very aggressive animals. They're not the smartest animals in the world. I'm not the smartest animal in the world. (laughs) I can identify with a sheep. Ah. They have to rely on their shepherd for protection. Sheep sheep can't defend themselves. They they don't really have teeth to bite with. They can't kick. They just graze and move from place to place. And like, where else are we going, shepherd? They, They rely on the shepherd for everything. And they have to listen to the voice of the shepherd. We have, the Bible says, a good shepherd. 
It says this in John 10. He said, I'm the good shepherd. He's our good shepherd. He's your shepherd. So as a sheep, you may not know what to do, where to go, what to say, how to behave, what, what's, what's protocol here or there. How am I going to do this, Lord? When do I pray about this, God? How am I going to face tomorrow, Lord? The sheep only worries about what's in front of them right here, right now. The shepherd's going to lead them to green pastures. Thank God. But the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Oh, my goodness. For his sake. Not because Joe Hooter needs it. But for his sake. He's a good shepherd. But my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. He knows you. He knows you. He knows what you're hurting from. He knows what you're facing. He knows your disappointments. He knows your desires. He knows you. And look at this. And they follow him. They follow him. See, our job is real simple. We recognize the shepherd. We listen to his voice. And we follow. Somehow we complicate this. <laughs> do we not? And we wonder though, how do I know? How do I know if it's God speaking to me? How do I know and how do I discern when it's the voice of God? Because you know his voice. Just like a, a, a baby born and they place that baby in its mama's arms and, and as it grows and that mama's interacting, that baby learns mama. And then that baby later when he starts talking wears out mama's name, mama, 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 just to say mama, just to be saying mama. But he's listening for that voice. And you can put a child in a room full of women and have that child's mama say, son, and he'll know. My mama could say my voice in the, in the middle of Pecan Land Mall, and I'd be like, that's my mama. I'm telling you. And we should be the same way with the voice of our Heavenly Father. How do you get there? How, how do we know that it's the voice of our biological parents? It's that relationship. You're with them. You spend time with them. You listen to them. Same thing, the same principle applies with our Heavenly Father. Amen. We are his sheep. And he knows us. So to discern the voice of God, I'm going to talk today about not hitting the snooze button. You're saying, well, Brother Joe, where, where are we going here? Hang in here. I may dive off a little in the deep end, but just stay with me, okay? God has something for us today, and, and I pray you listen and receive this in Jesus' name. John Piper once said that discerning is how we follow God's leading through the process of spiritually sensitive application of biblical truth, in particular, it's of our situation. So in our lives, we learn to listen. We attune our spiritual ears to hear the voice of God. Now, I'm going to tell you, people of the world, be careful who you hang around with because if you have non-believers, when we say, well, God told me today I was going to, and they look at you kind of crazy. And I asked Donnell this morning in the office at the house, I said, well, how many times do, you, do, you, do we kind of, our ears perk up when they say, well, you know, the devil told me to do it, right? You hear people on those, on those uh, crime shows and stuff, and they say, well, you know, there was voices told me to do it. The spiritual world is real, church. There is good and evil. There's, there is a battle. There's a battle for your soul. You are enjoying life physically on this planet, but your spirit will live, hear me, forever. There's only one of two places that you go from here, and we know that. We have to believe that. There are some people in this world who think that this is it. There are some people who think this is heaven. There are some people who believe that this world is going to get better and better and better until, ta-da, heaven has arrived. I don't know if you've looked lately, but this earth is not getting better. The scripture clearly tells us that it will pass away. 
It will go away. So when all else is said and done, what is the most important thing here, church? It's not what we feel and touch. It is what we cannot see. The spiritual realm. The spiritual world. The soul of man never dies. And to what we do in this life, in this world, right here, right now, determines where we spend eternity. This is why we have so many names on this prayer room, church. This is why we should be busy about the, the work of the Lord. Amen? Amen? You know, most office buildings have alarms in them. I, mean, I know my office building does. And interesting enough, when I was younger, it only, had, you know, in school, we only had like a bell. Blah, 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 you know, and it just, and it meant fire, tornado. It could mean anything. Well, today they got smart alarms, you know, and the lights will go off and they'll say, attention, attention, there's a fire in the building. Please walk to the nearest exit or attention, attention, there's a tornado report here. Please shelter in place. It tells you what to do. There's an alarm. And see, God sp speaks to us and prompts us in various ways, just like we could hear these alarms going off, but in the spirit. You know, when we say God speaks to us, you know, we're talking in the sense that he is prompting us, directing us, the discerning. His, his, his voice is talking to us as his sheep. And we learn to listen to him. And on, as an employee, if I ignore those alarms, though, when they do go off, because sometimes they do a test. And do we not have tests in our spiritual walk, church? And sometimes when you ignore that alarm, you know, there's, there could be consequences. If it was an actual fire in the building and I ignored all the tests and failed all those tests when the actual alarm went off and I failed that test, that could be very catastrophic for me. And church, the same thing, God has given us direction and using people in encounters, and I call them divine connections in our lives to help lead and guide and direct, just like God did in the Old Testament, prompting and helping lead us and shape us and mold us to the people we need to be, to, to walk in our destiny, if it were. When I was much younger, I had a terrible time waking up to go to school. Do y'all know anybody like that? Uh, I'm not going to mention somebody else who says like 50 alarms in the morning, but used to. I don't know if she does now. But anyway, um, I would hit that snooze button. And I don't know about your clocks today, but back then, if you had the snooze button on that alarm clock, yeah, I knew it was nine minutes, not 10, not eight, nine. I don't know why nine. But I'd hit that snooze button and it had nine more minutes. I'd roll over to sleep and alarm would bam, 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 go off again. Nine minutes, bam, bam, nine minutes. And I, and I had it down to a science. I could get this much sleep. I don't know why. It was just, you know, why do we do the things we do? But I'd hit that snooze button so many times until it was just the absolute last minute. And then I'd have to get up. But you know the problem with that is? <laughs> that process was not foolproof. Because after so many snoozes that I knew that the alarm would give me, it stopped giving me alarms. And you know what old Joe did? I just slept right on. I missed that appointment. I missed school. I missed the school bus. Uh, and my mom was not happy. When I got in college, some of those habits just bled over. Until one day I finally said, you know, if I can get up on the 10th alarm, why can't I get up on the first one? Now, that simple, like, duh moment, if you will, changed my life. I literally had to, when that first went off the next day, I hit that snooze. I was tempted just to roll over and snuggle back up on that pillow. But I threw them feet out of those covers and that cold air, put my feet on that cold floor. I didn't want to, but I got up. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, guess what? It got easier and easier. And you can ask Donnie, most mornings, I don't even need an alarm unless I haven't had much sleep the night before. Most times I'm up early in the morning, and I'm just like me and Jesus spending some time together. It totally changed your perspective. But just like that alarm clock, God speaks to us to take action in our lives. Get up, get up, get up, get up, Right? But instead of annoying buzzing sound and bells ring, God speaks to us in what he describes in the scripture as a still, small voice. And y'all know this. But in the book of Ezekiel, the Lord told the prophet, and if you won't turn to you, you can, but I will put it up on the screen for you. But Ezekiel 33, 7. God tells Ezekiel, and I love the book of Ezekiel, but I mean, it's such strong warning to the nation of Israel. 
It says, so you son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear the word from my mouth and warn them for me. He was in essence telling the prophet that he was making him the watchman for the people. He would warn them of imminent danger, spiritually speaking. And he would sound the alarm. You know, when I first got into Pentecostal church, we used to sing a song. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Sound the alarm in God's holy mountain. You know, we was like, all right, right. You know, and it'd be like, sound the alarm. I had no idea what we were singing. I was an old Baptist boy, but I was like, this is good. We'd be like, bringing in the sheaves. I mean, I'm talking Southern Baptist Baptist. But I was like, man, they, they, they get down with this worship. But later I found out it was like, yeah, Lord. There's an alarm. There's a stirring of the people. This, uh, it's a waking up the church. Wake up God's people. Don't hit the snooze button when God is speaking to his people. Hallelujah. And he's telling the prophet, even, let's go back and look at verse, uh, verses 3 through 6 in that same chapter. It says when he, And listen to this. This is what's going on. He says, he tells him, the watchman what his responsibilities are and what the outcomes are going to be. Listen to this, church. When he sees the sword, the watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, his job's done, right? But when whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, snooze. If the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. Mm. Lord, help me. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. Hallelujah. Get up. Come on. It's time to get up. It's time to work. Let's get going for the Lord. Amen. Don't hit that snooze button. Verse 6, but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, oh my, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person, any person, any person among them. He is taken away in his iniquity. But this, but his blood, I will require at the watchman's hand. Now, this was on the prophet. And he was giving him great instruction. You go back and look in chapter 3. He talks about the responsibility of Ezekiel. And let me tell you what. It was some heavy-duty warning and alarm that God was giving Ezekiel to tell the nation. They were doing some wicked and vile things, even in the secrets of the holy places of God. And they thought they were all being secrety and hidden from God, but God was like, I see everything. Even the false prophets, even the things that they were prophesying to gain their own profit. God said, man, they're working iniquity unto me. And God had Ezekiel do some outlandish stuff. Let me tell you, it was kind of out there to get the people's attention, to make a statement and say, God sees you. But God was telling both the prophet as well as the nation of Israel that when the alarm sounds, that they need to take action and not roll back over and hit the snooze button. Can the church say amen? God was calling his people to repentance. And two things could happen here. One, the watchman sounds the alarm and the people choose what action to take. I can either jump up and defend myself. I can get the battle stations or you hit the snooze button. And as the prophet, as the man of God, the watchman church, and I have to say, this is when the Holy Spirit was resting upon the man, the prophet. Where does the Holy Spirit reside today, Christian? In you. You are now a watchman. And the Lord's saying, you watchman, you must warn the people when you see danger. There is danger all around. We should be warning them to take action. You need to be saved. You're living in sin. Oh, I can't upset them, Brother Joe. Well, if you don't warn them, the scripture's clear that the blood would be on the hand of the watchman. We should and always obey the voice of God. Amen. When you have a prompting, when you have that unction of the Holy Spirit, don't Hit the snooze button. 
I'm guilty. I have quenched the Spirit. I have, I have felt the Spirit of God moving in service before and not step out and obey the unction of the Holy Spirit to do something. Because my pride, myself got in the way. And I later look back and say, Lord, forgive me. You think God stopped loving me because I maybe failed that moment? No. Not one time. Not one time. But see the way God's telling his people that we need to be on the ready. When the Lord sounds the alarm, we need to act. And we don't need to hit that spiritual snooze button. We need to get rid of that snooze, snooze button if we can, just all together. Just get rid of it. Well, what do you mean by the snooze button, Brother Joe? One, we, ne- we need to learn to listen to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Just like a baby learns to hear its mama's voice. It's relationship. Can I say that again? It's relationship. Just like the prophet, oh, God speaks in still small voices. In fact, the Amplified Classic Version, when he said the still small voice, it reference, it reads whisper. Y'all have heard a whisper, right? John 10, 27 says we will follow him. We need to be sensitive. Number two, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and not ignore his direction. Hebrew chapter 4, it reads, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. Do not hit the snooze button on Jesus. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 21, And your ears shall hear the word behind you, saying, This is the way. Walk in it. When you turn to the right, when you turn to the left. That still, small voice, that direction, that unction, that that tugging of the heart. You felt it the first time the Holy Spirit tugged on your heartstrings for salvation. Your, your, your palms were probably sweaty. Your, your, your heart was probably pounding in your chest. And that pastor was standing up there saying, if you will, come down and make a public profession of faith. I don't want to go. And then they say something like, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before my father, I'll be ashamed of you before me and I'll be ashamed of you before my father. Oh, and then your knees all about to buckle underneath your own weight and you step out of that aisle and somehow you just you appear at the front of the church. You don't know how you got there. All you know is I need Jesus. I need to be saved right now. That's that voice. And that's just the first instance, church. It doesn't stop there. For some of us, for some of us in churches today, when they make it that far, that's it. Oh, thank God. I got on the bus. Let's ride to glory land. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. What is that? The good old gospel ship. That's it. Or the, what's that train? This train, this bound for glory. One of them vehicles anyway. You got your ticket. You're on board. You made it. Hallelujah. But see, there's, there's work to be done now. You're part of the family. You're part of the, the, the bride. It's, it's about sheep. It's about fruit. It's about growing. It's about listening to the Holy Spirit and being guided by Him and and reaching others now. Discerning the voice of God is something we need to learn as a Christian and as we grow and mature in Him. Can you say amen? Our challenge is that there may be other voices to discern. Huh. What other voices? Do we have that up there? The other voices? Well, first of all, is God's voice. Uh, Can I tell you, God's voice, the real thing. God's voice is the real thing. But you may hear voices of the world. That could be voices of others, peer pressure. Is peer pressure destructive? Worldly standards of success. There's been many um, men throw their family to the side chasing that. That golden, that golden ring or brass ring or whatever it is. But they sacrificed their family for that. How about the, the flesh, our, our own desires and thoughts, many of which are 
selfish. The devil. Mm. Demonic temptation, misdirection from Satan and his forces. And the conscience, our moral sense of right and wrong. You, send, you hear a lot about this one. Our moral sense of right and wrong. That we obtain from our upbringing. I'm going to tell you, I wasn't brought up the way you were brought up. My moral sense of right and wrong probably wasn't the same, isn't the same now, it probably was when I first left home. Because when I was brought up, it was nine brothers and sisters, and if one got in trouble, we all got in trouble. We all got it. You lied. The right and wrong was you lied to cover yourself. There was so much cover up, it was like, you know, one of them government <laughs> cover up schemes. You know, it was like, don't you tell mama. Because if, if they got in trouble, that was just how mom would just, you know, 10 kids. My father died when I was four. I had a sister who had, quadri- she, she was, had polio, was quadriplegic, completely bedridden. So mama didn't have time to wrestle all of us snotty yos young. We always had to play out in the yard. And guess what? There was always something to get into in the yard. We were breaking stuff, getting into things. Let's see what else we can come up with. We burned things. I mean, we just kids in the country. My mama just, if you mess up, mm, so is light. No, no, you, you're not. No, don't go crying to mama. <laughs> but today I realize lying is bad. <laughs> so your moral sense of right and wrong can change. Sometimes we're hindered and skewed by a sense of justice, of righteousness, perhaps our extreme legalism, or perhaps uh, insensitivity to certain sins. Maybe certain sins like lying for me wasn't a problem back then. Hey, I'm just being honest with y'all. y'all are y'all with me this morning? Y'all don't shout me down this morning now. But can I tell you something? Listen to this. Our conscience is strongly influenced by the culture we grow up in. However, this is the most important thing. The conscience can be educated by the word of God as we seek his way. Because see, I was brought up thinking this is how we got to do could you imagine if I was never corrected by the word of God that some of this stuff was sinful and I go into the workplace and now something happened to be like, we've got to cover that up. That doesn't happen in the workplace. That doesn't happen in government, does it? No. Okay, I'm, I'm meddling now. Okay. So the scripture teaches us, the scripture teaches that and it's a learning process. Hear me. It's a learning process to discern the voice of God. You don't just say, Lord, I accept you, my personal Savior. Boom, I'm hearing him just like a, hey, God, I'm so glad I got saved today. We're going to be, I'm a, I, this is my personal cell phone with you now, Lord. You know, just call me anytime, I'll call you. No, it's, it's a learning process. In fact, the writer of Hebrews describes the learning process in discerning the voice of God as this, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are mature, mature of full age in the faith we're talking about. That is, those who by reason of, and the word used here, use, does it put the word use in there? Yeah. One translation, the word use is practice. Y'all remember in, uh, well, y'all remember in school, in band, they used to say, we used to say, you know, practice makes perfect. But in band, we'd always say perfect practice makes perfect. Because you could practice something wrong. Can you not? So here, being mature in the spirit, a full age, spiritually speaking, are those of reason of practice or use. And they have their senses exercised to look, discern both what? Good and evil. We can mature in our sensitivity and discernment in God's voice. We can also tune him out. Oh, pastor. God may want me to go to the mission field. God may want me to give, give, give some of my money to, to some project at the church. God, God may want me to go help a widow with something at her house. I ain't got time for that, Lord. God may want me to go visit the sick. God may, we, God may be calling you. God may be, un, you hear me? There may be things all of a sudden you're like, Lord, I, I, I really hear, you know, maybe that's not you. Maybe that's just me trying to be all good. <laughs> But we grow, we listen. But see, just like in Ezekiel, we choose to listen and act when we hear the voice of God. Can you say amen? When I was a kid, I used to jump off the school bus at 3, 
I think we got Mr. Harold's bus like 315. Run in the door, turn the TV on, and Tom and Jerry be on TV8. And I remember one, and it just, I don't know why to this day I still remember that one episode, Tom and Jerry, Tom, he was trying to be good. And do we have that picture up there? I think Donnie may have got that picture. Is it up there? Y'all see this? Um, Tom had to make a decision to do something good or bad. Have y'all ever felt this way? Come on. Y'all ever feel this way? Like you're standing there with a choice and all of a sudden it's like, come on, you can do it. You can do it. It's like, don't do it. Don't do it. And you're like, oh, what do I do? You're going to yield to this one or to that one. The choice is yours. Why? God gave you a free will. You have a choice. God's not going to force you. He's not twisting your arm. He's not going to, to, to force it down your throat or whatever they say. But he's going to guide and direct and give you that. God gives you and I free will to choose to listen to him or hit the snooze button or turn his voice off. You can see it when they're exerting a toddler. And most recently, I'm not going to mention one toddler in particular that I know very well. But when he did something the first time, it was like, yay, we're so proud of you. And he'd do it again or we'd ask him to do it again. He'd go off and do it and like, yeah, all right, reinforcement. But then when he got busy doing something he was interested in. And we'd say, hey, go do that, whatever. And this is what it, I don't know if y'all want to see me, but this is what it looked like. He'd be busy doing something. And he'd just look over there like, like, I hear you, but I ain't listening. And we do the same thing to God, don't we? We can hear the spirit of God, and we hit that snooze button. We're like, ah, oh, I hear the, he's making some sort of racket at me. Let me just turn God off for just a minute. I need to snooze because I'm busy. <laughs> We must crucify, the Bible says, this flesh. Right. Woo. Right. Oh, man, that's no fun. Paul, Paul said, Galatians 5, verse 26, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and with their passions and desires. See, it's put God first. Y'all remember the scripture that says, put, put ye first the kingdom of God and my righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. What things, Brother Joe? All of it. <laughs> I can't put it any clearer. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 21 through 26, and, and this is just, I, you don't have that one up here, uh, Kira, but this, this, I'll just read this to you, but this translation reads, my son, preserve sound judgment and discernment. Now, when you preserve something, that means to what? Keep it. Like, you know, preserve peaches or figs, right? Do not let them out of your sight. And here's why. They will be life to you an ornament to grace your neck. They will give you your way in safety. Your foot will not stumble. And that's some good stuff, is it not? We all want to be safe. We all want to walk in this life and not stumble. Amen. And when you lie down, here's another good one. You will not be afraid. And when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Amen. Lord, and the church church says, Amen. amen. Have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be your confidence. The Lord will be your confidence. And will keep your foot from being snared. No traps for you. He will keep you. See, we don't always realize how God speaks to us, but he does. We know this, don't we? But most of the time... He speaks to us in, gentle, in a gentle whisper. It's not something loud. It's not something forceful. Remember, it's called that still, small voice. We feel an impression, a prompting. It's not in our head. It's in our heart. And I know for a, a young Christian, a new Christian, a new believer in the faith of Jesus, sometimes struggle with this. That's why I asked when we first started, how do you know it's the voice of God speaking to you? Because sometimes we make choices and we, we have these other things that's kind of pulling and drawing at us, do we not? And that's where discernment comes in. This is why we must discern the spirits. How do you discern them? Here, right here, is a standard. There's a standard. You, if, if, it, if, it does, if it goes against the word of God, then it's not God. I'm going to tell you right now. But I'm going to tell you, six times in the gospel, Jesus said he 
who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. If Jesus repeated it, you, you better believe it's important. <laughs> Everyone has ears. He wasn't talking about physical ears either. He was talking about those, those spiritual ears, those inner ears. Not the inner ear here, but the inner ear here in the soul of man. He was saying you're sensitive to be still, to that, to that still small voice. And I'm asking you paying attention what you're hearing from the Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you today? What is the Lord prompting you and guiding you? You know, there, there are different things um, that come in our lives, and we ignore those things. But for example, yesterday, Donnie and I, we went to a particular place of business, and I was in there previously, and it was so busy and chaotic. The internet was down. His paper's desk was full of papers and just couldn't get a word in edgewise. And he said, could you just come back later or tomorrow? And I said, sure, no problem. Of course, I've got things to do, but, you know, he was obviously tied up, so no problem. So we go back tomorrow, the next day, and it's quiet. His Internet's working. His computer's fine. It's not so much paper on his desk, and he's just sitting there like this when I walk in the door, waiting for me to get there. He didn't know I was coming at that time, but anyway, he was waiting for anybody to walk in that door for business. And he goes, oh, good, I'm glad you come back. And, and in that moment, we did the transaction that we were going to do. He noticed the name of the church. And I told him I was a pastor of the church and so forth. And he said, well, you know, I used to go to a particular church several years ago. And he, in fact, I knew the pastor of the church he mentioned. And I mean, it was years ago. And he proceeded to say, and I got hurt in that church. And I've never been back. To any church. And I said, oh, that, that's a shame. And I thought to myself, Lord, you've, you've made this connection right here for this man today. And I'm going to tell you, the man is 80 years old. He's let a lot of water go under that bridge. He's let a lot of time pass him by. Because somebody else hurt him who was in the church. That should never, ever happen in the church. And yet people use things like that to be an excuse. Well, Brother Joe didn't shake my hand. I'm never coming. And I'm going to be honest with you. Sister Regina's mama, you know, they're not here today. But I'm going to tell you, the first day that Brother Lonnie and Sister Regina came, it was one of those days I was just busy and running around. You guys know how I get sometimes. Brother Lonnie was here and come up and said, hey, how you doing? I didn't get to speak to her. I didn't shake her hand. I never said hi. I never said, how you doing? And when they left, she said, the pastor didn't even say hi to me. He didn't even speak to me. But because of the grace of God in her heart, they came back and gave me a second chance, if you will. But to this day, we laugh about it. We're like, well, you know, I'm not going to get pastor of the year. <laughs> but, but the thing is, we don't need to look for excuses to stay away from Christ. We don't need to find things to burden ourselves and burden the church with. We need to forgive and be Christ-like. Come on. You see, God may be prompting you to be good to a co-worker. God, and you may not like them. There may be something about them, but the Lord said you need to be good to them. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you feel compassion for something. For somebody. Give them a, give them a word of encouragement. God wouldn't have given you a prompting if he didn't want you or didn't have you to have a need for it. You don't know what people are going through. You can't judge by the outside. But you can hear that still, small voice where God's lead you. The more you obey that still, small voice, the more God is able to use you. Sometimes you feel an unrest. Have you all been there before? You get into maybe a, a business agreement or somebody's one of these shake hand kind of deals. And immediately, as soon as you kind of make plans for that, all of a sudden it's like, I shouldn't do this. Have y'all been there? <laughs> that uneasiness, like alarm bells going off. That's that still small voice. That's God telling you that you don't need to enter into this agreement. You don't need to do this. God will warn you about things to stay out of. God will prompt you in ways to go. It's not just a one-sided deal, church. 
God sees things that we can't see. He knows where the dead ends are in your life. When I look back over my life, I have made some mistakes. Because I've had those promptings in my life from the Holy Spirit. And I ignored them. And later I said, if I had just done what the, what the Spirit was telling me to do, if I had just listened to that still, small voice, I would have saved myself all this trouble. There was a man <clears throat> who was driving home one day. He had a yard service, big city. I think it was California somewhere, but Christian man. He drove home the same route every day, every day, same route, same route, same route. This one particular day, he had this feeling, don't go that way home. He ignored it. He ignored it, and when he got to the, one of the intersections that he always comes to, these, these guys jumped him and carjacked him. But not only that, they beat him up, they broke his arm, they left him for dead, they took his equipment, took his truck. He later said, <laughs> I would have saved myself all that heartache and trouble if I had just listened to that voice of God. He, and he knew it was God. See, that's how the still small voice works. That's how God will lead and direct you. God sees things that we can't see. He knows where those things are that we need to avoid. If there's an unrest and you feel it in your spirit, then back off. <laughs> it's not because God's punishing you and keeping you for something. He's, he's wanting to protect you. When you have a big decision, something you're concerned about, Maybe you need to change jobs. Maybe you're going in business with somebody. There's something important. Let me suggest to you, get quiet. Get alone with God and listen for his direction. You can't hear if you're always busy. If it's noisy, stressed out, getting opinions from others, on the phone all the time, get alone with him. Let him talk to you. It's about that relationship. So you need times of peace, times where you get quiet and hear his voice. Right. See, when I was in college, I started praying specifically, Lord, make my soul, make my heart sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And that was my, that was my prayer. And not long after that, I uh, went to a, a, a charismatic church, and they had a move of the Holy Spirit. I was scared to death, y'all know that. I literally was in the back of the church watching everybody. Things were going crazy. And let me tell you what, as a Pentecostal now, I'd be like, woo, praise God, I'd be right in the middle of it. But then, as a good old Baptist boy, never seen this ever, 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 ever in my life, I'm standing there with my arms like this, like, what is going on? And I literally prayed, God, please get me out of here. I'm not kidding. I prayed, God, if you get me out of here, I'll never come back. I'll never come back. Now, what kind of prayer is that? See, what happened was my flesh was so scared of a move of the Holy Spirit, and it was really a move of the Holy Spirit. People got, people got healed in that service. People were being slain in the Spirit, saved, being set free, delivered, and I wasn't back there rejoicing because I was in spiritual bondage too. My flesh was praying out like, get out of here, get out of here, run. <laughs> but you know, God has got a good sense of humor, does he not? I'm sitting there going, God, get me out of this Pentecostal church. I'll never come back. And God's like, <laughs> you're going to pastor a Pentecostal church, boy. <laughs> what? Yeah. Never tell God never. Don't hit that snooze button on him. Because <laughs> he may come with a bucket of cold water. <laughs> Be like, pow. Remember, God's ways are higher than our ways. You may not know how things are going to work out right now. You don't have the answer, but can I tell you who has the answer? And you can trust him implicitly. You don't know. Look, from one year to the next, a lot can change. When you develop these skills, listen for the whisper, listen for the Holy Spirit. Fall on that still, small voice. God will not only take you further, but he'll protect you from the things that you would cause, would cause you heartache and pain. Can you say amen to that? I've heard it once said, and this is a quote, the, the loudest voice in your life should be the still, small voice of the Lord. Wow. You see, the whisper will be quiet. Um, 
And some people say, well, Brother Joe, why not whisper? You see, in 1 Kings chapter 19, the prophet Elijah was in a difficult place. He'd just killed like 400 plus prophets of Baal. He was on the run because, you know, the queen was like, get him. <laughs> she was mad. He was discouraged. But here's the thing. In verse 11 of chapter 19 of 1 Kings, it says, there was a great and powerful wind that tore the mountains apart. <laughs> wow, what kind of wind is that? And it shattered the rocks. You would think that surely God showed up in that. We know the story. Yeah, that was so powerful, but it goes on to say that God was not in the wind. After the wind, there was a great earthquake, something even bigger than the windstorm. And we know God was not in that. And after the wind and after the earthquake, there was a great fire. Lord Jesus, they would just keep coming, don't they? But even in the great fire, God was still not in that. But it says, and then the scripture says, there came a gentle whisper. Now, God was showing us how he speaks. When all the circumstances are loud, it's noisy, thoughts telling you, what are you going to do? How are you going to work it out? People coming against you. It's easy to get stressed, is it not? It's easy to get confused. God's wanting you to come back to that quiet place. He's wanting you to come back to that quiet place because the reason God's whisper is because he is close to you. You can't whisper to someone across town. You can't really whisper to someone across the room. That'd be no good, did it? Brother Gary didn't hear me. <laughs> Psalm 25 says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. When you honor God, he'll tell you secrets. Praise God. He whispers things in your spirit that you and I have no way of knowing. And there's time and time of testimonies of Christian men and women who God revealed things. I'm talking about inventions, medically, technology. Sometimes, uh, in, in fact... Um, one particular testimony was that guy was asleep and he just learned to keep his notepad by the bed because the Lord would just give him one idea after another and every one of them was big inventions. Solving problems that nobody else could figure out but God just wake him up and go and he'd go back to sleep. Come into work the next day, hey guys, check this out. Where did you get this? God. You know, the world looks at it and goes, you, you know, that's, a, that's insane. That's crazy. But God has got a way where well, it makes no sense. The Bible says that the foolishness of God confounds the wisdom of man. Is that right? The gentle whisper is the secret of God. It always makes sense. It may not seem logical to you, but the facts that may not line up. But God, he's prompting you. There's a story of a gentleman one time he bought a piece of property. He don't know why, but he just felt like, I need to buy this property. It was dirt cheap. It was junk property. It was nothing could grow on it. He couldn't grow crops on it. He couldn't grow cattle on it. It was got rocks, and it was just no, no good vegetation out there. But for whatever reason, he just felt compelled to buy it. Fifteen years went by, nothing. He'd go out there and check on the land. He's like, Lord, I know you, I know you wanted me to buy this land for some reason. Fifteen years later, the state come through and said, uh, we got to put a major highway right through your property. He, he made over 100 times the investment on that property. Made no sense to nobody at that time. So a reporter came out and asked him, and, and, and I wrote the quote down. The reporter came out and said, sir, uh, you sure know how to pick a piece of property. And that was his, what the reporter told him. And he said, yes, my father told me about this place. <laughs> the reporter said, I didn't know your dad was in real estate. And the man pointed up and he said, I'm talking about my heavenly father. That still, small voice. Come on, Brother RJ. See, God, God is about God in directing. God's about helping us. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It may not happen the way you think things are going to happen. We may mess things up. We may hit the snooze button. We may fall short. 
But follow that still, small voice. I believe that God's whispering something to each of us today in the church. Some of you are walking closer to the Lord this year than you were the year before. And I praise God for that. Some of you, God is working through things in your life that you have dealt with for years. God may be dealing with you to do things, something kind of illogical for you, and you don't know why, but I'm here to tell you, discern it, listen, seek God. Can I give you some practical application here today? Here's some practical steps to help you discern the voice of God. Number one, look at the scripture. As a Christian, we want to be rooted in God's word. God is not going to tell you to do something that is contrary to what he says in his written word. Okay? Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This word. Number two, seek godly counsel. How do you know it's God's voice? Well, seek. There's elders. There's, there's some aged Christians. I'm not talking about chronologically either because Timothy was a pastor and, and he learned that sometimes there's some old fools amongst us. But I'm talking about the, the people who, are, who have grown up and are strong in the Lord and their faith is strong and their walk is strong. Our elders. But seek godly counsel. Proverbs 11:14, 14. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Thirdly, is there peace or turmoil about it? Sometimes you may be in the middle of something, you may be facing a decision, and you just don't know what to do. But Colossians 3, verse 15, and this is an amplified classic, but it says, Let the peace, soul harmony, which comes from Christ's rule, and what it said, I love this, let it rule, let the peace of God rule like an umpire. Y'all watch the game? The umpire calls the game, does it not? Safe, you're out of here, right? But he says, let that peace of Christ rule, act as, a, as an umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling, listen to this, with finality, all the questions that arise in your mind. So God can give you peace and he can give you finality. He can give you direction. This is God's word here today. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix this. I, I've made a mess in my life, but guess who can make a, a sense of it all? The Bible says, and yes, the Lord himself will restore the years that the locust has eaten up. That the canker worm has destroyed. God himself can restore all of those years that you've wasted. Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he can give you peace about it. There will be no turmoil. And to which of the members of the Christ, one body you were also called to live and be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God when? Always. Hallelujah. Number four, look at the impact of others. Romans 8, 14 says this, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons, and I'm going to throw this in, daughters of God too. We're, we're his children. And number five, look at God's characteristics. His nature is our loving, heavenly Father. John verse, chapter 15, verse 9, it reads, as the Father loved me. This is Jesus talking. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Can you say amen to that, church? Today I hope that I've challenged you. Today I hope that you have realized that you may be hitting that snooze button in your life. You may be tuning God out. You may be saying, Lord, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. So you know what? It's easier for me to do my own thing than listen to you. I want to pray this prayer with you this morning. Will you pray with me? Lord, I pray that you make our hearts sensitive this morning to the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we need to hear from you. And Jesus, we don't want to tune you out. We don't want to grieve you. We don't want to quench your spirit. God, we want to be the church that you've called us to be. We want to be the bride that you are looking to come back and receive to yourself. 
Father, we thank you for the spiritual garments of sound judgment and discernment. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help us to remember to wear them in faith and to use them to help us safely navigate our way through this dark and evil world, Lord. Lord, help us to avoid every trap of the enemy along the way so that at the end of the day, God, that we can enjoy your peace. We can enjoy your peace in Jesus' name. We pray all of these things. And the church says amen. I don't want to close this service without giving you an opportunity today and you online to make Jesus Christ your personal Savior. Because I'm going to tell you what, that's the main reason we're here. And the church says, amen. Jesus himself come to seek and save that which was lost. So today, there's an opportunity right now to make Jesus Christ your Lord and personal Savior right now. So what does it take, Brother Joe? Well, Romans 9 excuse me, chapter 10, verse 9 states that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if that's today, me and this church are praying. Me and this church are praying. So church, would you help us pray right now for those that may be watching live today, maybe in the sanctuary right now. Will we just stop and just respect the Holy Spirit one more time? Would you, just, would you just right now just bow your head, close your eyes for just a moment? Would you just seek the Lord? Would you ask him, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that that drawing, the wooing of the Holy Spirit would call those who may not know you, may not be sold out, Lord, who needs you, Jesus. That, Lord, you would convict them of their wrong and compel them, Lord, to make the decision to make you, Lord, and Savior of their life. If that's you today, brother and sister, pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you into my heart and I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. (laughs) If you made that decision today, let us know. If you made that decision in this, in this sanctuary, I want to talk to you at the end of the service today. We, we want to, we want to, um, First of all, acknowledge the fact that you have made that personal choice, that you've made that commitment and said, Lord, you're now my personal Savior. That, that, that voice you heard today that's calling you to salvation is the first step of many more steps in your walk in faith.